the life cycle of the condom. It's the, that's that's not a real thing, Steve. The life cycle of the condom. All right. By is, Carla Zamanja. Is as follows. Uh, initially, we the uh, condom was a separate plot point. It was an actual plot point. Um, we gave it to uh, Lonnie, and we had Sam find it in Lonnie's purse, and it made Sam worried um, about what the hell she was doing with it, etc. And uh, that was uh, sort of a wedge to drive them apart when that was the storyline, which it no longer is. Uh, and because we decided we hated it. <laughs> um, but uh, I had already made the um, the condom asset, uh, which I'm actually really proud of. I really like that condom. <laughs> it's really good. Um, also, I think Nero is a really good brand for condoms. Anyway. Uh, yeah, it's a play on Trojan and everything, yeah, but it obviously. works. And... But it's, you know, it's the whole, like, uh, notably decadent, you know, right, it's like, yeah. it's per anyway, I like it. I'm, yeah. pr I'm proud of this thing. Uh, the, so The specular on it looks really nice. <laughs> it does look good. I don't know. So yeah. we, we had this, you know, extra asset lying around, and, <clears throat> and we were like, we were, we were all, oh, it's a shame that it's going to waste, but, you know, whatever, sometimes things don't get used. And then we remembered the horror of digging around in your parents' drawers and finding their condoms and stuff and being just utterly fucking horrified. And uh, we decided we'd give that to you, the player. <laughs> One of my favorite things that came out during development was someone uh, wrote an email mistakenly referring to mittens, and Steve replied in the voice of Katie, saying, It's just mitten. She's only one cat, Mom. So th there's a lot less density in the house than there would be in a real house. Like, if you look around your house, there's just junk piled everywhere, probably. <laughs> Maybe like, it's just our house. <laughs> I think it's most house. Oh, you're um, right. <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, our strategy was you either fully invest in something and, you know, put, like, a plausible representation of this aspect of a room in, or you just don't put it in at all. And the player will fill in the gaps between, like, oh, these are all the things that represent the kind of room I'm supposed to be in, and it doesn't jump out at me that there's no toilet plungers in the bathroom or, or whatever. But the biggest mm -hmm. instance of this that I think actually totally worked, because no one has ever called yeah, it out, is, surprise, think about it, there are no shoes in this house. Mm. Ta-da! Where's <laughs> uh, your brain now? <laughs> and, and I don't think anybody's noticed it, and yeah. I think it's because... If we had put one pair yeah. of shoes or two pairs of shoes, people would have said, where are all the rest of the shoes? Right. But really, to have a plausible house, Mom would have to have ten pairs of shoes and her work boots, and Dad would need to have some tennis shoes and some work shoes and so on and so forth. So we just said, there aren't going to be any shoes, and we hope nobody notices.
another board game. Uh, this one wasn't done by me, though. This one was done by Carla. Uh, but I really like it because the ghost figures on the back of the game are actually uh, long-deceased family members of mine. Um, when I was home at Christmas, I was digging through my family's basement, sort of getting an idea of what a, a basement has in it, um, just sort of for set dressing purposes. And while I was down there, I found a big box that my family actually um, hadn't seen. Uh, we got a big box of things from my grandmother after she passed away. And inside this box was all these tin types, um, love letters and, and, and um, sort of emigration papers and notes from as far back as the 1850s when my family had emigrated from Scotland and Ireland. And um, um, I asked my family if it was possible that I include these in some sort of artistic project, and they said, sure, they gave me their blessing. And I scanned them, and I didn't know if they were actually going to make it in the game, but um, then I saw that Carla had made this game, and uh, really liked that they showed up as, as ghosts in the back of it. Um, and it's, it's sort of, uh, I think, a nod, of, nod for idle thumbs as who uh, really feel quite passionately about uh, ghosts, as it turns out. Surprise! Almost none of the events, the little events in the game, are scripted um, as far as like triggering when you do something specific. So all of the thunder and lightning and the creaky noises in the house, um, they're all just randomized on timers. Um, the only like scripted, scripted thing is in the um, secret passageway when you look at the crucifix there's scripting that detects that you did that and then it causes the light to, to pop, um, which is the, yeah, my one indulgence of like messing with the player. Um, but we've had a lot of people play the game and say, you know, oh, the way you scripted it so that right when I walked into the TV room there was that big thunder and lightning strike, like, that, that was really spooky or, or, you know, I walked through that one door and then you played that sound behind me and it's like, <laughs> it's awesome that the combination of all the different kind of like significant actions you can do in the game, right. like crossing into a new room or opening a door or this side or the other thing, and the randomization of, of stuff can make it seem like the random elements 
have extra significance to them, but in fact, it's like, you just got lucky, basically. Yeah, it's total apophenia, because, like, yeah, it's just, because uh, there's, yeah, there's enough random things going on, and you can do enough things that eventually some of them are going to line up, yeah. which is, you know, cool. I really enjoyed playing God Home. Um, I have to say it was pretty exciting to find the Heavens to Betsy tape, you know, because that was really, I mean, those songs really did come out on a cassette tape at the time, and that really was how people discovered the music, was was getting a cassette tape passed around. Um, so getting to put it in the actual tape player and play it and listen to our song, um, it definitely gave me chills. I mean, it was like, wow, you know, how exciting for a young person today to, to get that, that moment of discovery um, and to listen to our music. I mean, it's, I think it's great. Uh, okay, the wildfire book. Oh, man, look at this thing. Yeah, I, uh, this was another one of those situations in which I totally felt like a weird creepo when I was doing research, <laughs> and there was a lot of, uh, really horrifying romance novel covers. Uh, this poor guy, um, was on somebody's Flickr account, uh, that was, um, allowed, that was, a uh, Creative Commons attribution licensed, um, and uh, I think he was playing volleyball or something. Uh, and um, I don't know. So I... you just put suspenders yes. on him and put an axe in his hand, and now he's a fireman. Yes, I did. <laughs> it's the I best. I did it, and I will cop to it, and I do it again. Um, also, uh, as I recall, because I'm a noob, I initially picked total bondage suspenders. That's true. I, I want. I, so you had started working on it, and I went upstairs, and then I came back down. And like Yaron and, and I were like, you know, look, we're all like, hmm, what should we do for this? And thing? I was, and I like, was like, yeah. those are fucking leather daddy suspenders. <laughs> and, what are you doing? And what I should have said is, damn it, he noticed. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to lie to mom and dad. Like when Lonnie asked me to see a band with her and stay over at her friend's place in the city after. That's a lie to mom and dad situation. But it was so worth it. The girls on stage were just so loud and real and awesome. And everybody was moving together like one huge tide of sound. Between two songs, Lonnie leaned over and said, how do you like your first show? I was so happy. I felt tears starting in my eyes. And then she up and hugged me. I think she could tell.
doors were actually one of the hardest things in the game to get working correctly, and uh, I know that there's still some bugs existing with the doors, actually. Um, but it's a surprisingly hard problem, which is why most video games uh, just have... The doors were actually one of the hardest things in the game to get working correctly, and uh, I know that there's still some bugs existing with the doors, actually. Um, but it's a surprisingly hard problem, which is why most video games uh, just have doors that kind of slide away into nothingness or open in strange ways or don't, you know, let you interact fully with doors. But of course, it's in a house like in Gone Home, a realistic house, it's uh, important that everything be as natural as possible. Uh, the one concession we made to video gaminess is that the doors all swing both ways, which never happens in a real house, but it's necessary to prevent the player trapping themselves in some strange Um, this is where you find the first half of Sam's Locker, or I guess it's actually the second half of Sam's Locker combo as far as uh, what the piece of paper is. But um, at first, I, there were... Th this the, the, the locker combination sheet was torn into three pieces. So you had one digit um, on, on each of them, and it was actually right before we sent out our, our IGF build to the judges... It was the night before, and Carla came down to the basement, and she was like, at 3 o'clock in the morning last night, I woke up in bed just being like, oh, we can't have it in three pieces, that's way too gamey. Well, that's, that's bad, we have to fix that. And, I forgot about that. And <laughs> you were absolutely right. And you've had a couple of those yeah. uh, being woken up by us making a bad decision uh, kind of moments over the course of the development, and they were always um, important changes that needed to be made. Yeah, I ended up being pretty happy with this. This, this is the only picture of Lonnie that we had for a really long time, um, and I was really glad to actually come up with something that we liked, uh, since this kind of thing is really hard, especially when... Lonnie came over today, but everything was... different. She was sitting at my desk chair, and she wouldn't look at me. Finally, I asked her what was going on. She said she felt like she'd done something wrong that night in the city. Like I must think... But I said no. There was nothing wrong. 
I just wanted to say, but I couldn't find the words. It felt like I was gonna cry, but I wasn't sad. She got up and sat next to me on the bed. I looked at her. Lonnie, do you think you could ever... And that's when she kissed me. <laughs> yeah, I ended up being pretty happy with this. This is the only picture of Lonnie that we had for a really long time. Um, and I was really glad to actually come up with something that we liked, uh, since this kind of thing is really hard, especially when um, it is such a major character. Um, uh, the other thing is, um, Lonnie has a cross necklace. Um, she uh, also has some Catholicism in her family. Yeah, and I think that's something that, I don't think that particular detail has been called out by anybody. Yeah, exactly. People notice, like, the Bibles and, and whatnot, but yeah, I... I intended for Lonnie, like, I thought it would be interesting if she came from a more conservative family than than Sam's in that she actually wears a cross necklace and carries some, you know, Catholicism with her, and her dad was an army guy, and, you know, um, her background is even, in some ways, maybe kind of more stifling than Sam's, and that's probably why she's a more, like, openly rebellious person on the outside. Composing the ambient exploration tracks definitely ended up being the weirdest part of creating music for Gone Home. The audio diaries tended to take precedence since they had such clear criteria for completion, so the ambient tracks were the last things I did. I spent so long immersed in the logs, which were very specifically timed, uh, that to suddenly shift gears to creating these slow, standalone five-minute pieces was surprisingly difficult. I remember giving Steve a first stab at the ambient track for part two of the game, and I didn't hear anything back about it. When I eventually asked if he had any feedback, he said something like, Oh yeah, it's great. I just slowed it down by 50% and it totally works, which cracked me up uh, because I definitely didn't have that in mind. Um, but that's one of the great things about collaborative work, uh, so I just went with it. I ended up doing a number of further revisions where I'd alter elements of the original version uh, specifically to affect how the 50% slowed version would sound. It was definitely a new experience for me, writing bits of music and trying to imagine how they would sound after it's been considerably distorted. It got weirder though. The ambient track for part one ended up being a backwards version of the slowed down part two track. And again, there were elements that sounded good at 50% slow forwards, but not at 50% slow backwards. So again, I went back to the original track and started altering elements so they would sound better at half speed in reverse. Um, I don't know if that's a thing ambient composers end up getting used to, but for me, it definitely felt like going down the rabbit hole. It's different now. I mean, we still hang out all the time like before. But now when no one else is around, well, you know, so you could say we're dating, but it's secret. 
Secret dating? I don't know. I mean, I guess that's the real difference. Now when we get off the phone or go home for the night, where it's just quiet and we're alone, we say I love you. One of the uh, larger assets that we needed for the basement to really give it character and personality was a furnace. And uh, when we were initially thinking of the furnace, Steve had mentioned to me the furnace from uh, Home Alone, which if you're from, uh, if you grew up in the 90s like I did, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so I did a lot of research and uh, looked up stuff that could kind of evoke a similar feeling. And we finally settled upon octopus furnaces, which are like, um, they're f a thematically and um, time-wise, very appropriate. Uh, there are these giant hulking monstrosities with all these arms covered in asbestos. Uh, really perfect, so we ended up modeling one of those and put it in the corner, and I think it turned out okay. I'm so stupid sometimes. I was telling Lonnie that I got into my college summer program thing, and I was all making plans like, you should come visit me, stay in my dorm room. But she said, Sam, I ship out on June 6th. I was like, ship out? To where? She said, to basic training. What did you think I was doing all that ROTC stuff for? I guess she's been planning to join the army right after high school since she was like, 12. And I guess she's really going to do it. So I was like, after graduation, I'm just never going to see you again? She said, let's just have fun while we can. So two things. Uh, one, mom's Canadian. Yay. Two, mom didn't start out Canadian. <laughs> um, the reason that mom is Canadian is because uh, Kate Craig and Emily Carroll are Canadian. And early on in, um, in, in the development of the game, Emily did mom's handwriting. Um, this is before uh, she did any of the UI text or anything. Right, and it was before we decided that all the moms were going to actually be written by moms and all that kind of stuff. Integrity um, in moms. And and so uh, we had we had the um, the answering machine note in the foyer, and there what the the line what's the actual line that's there? It's like um, neighborhood. Right. Yeah. yeah. So so. The, the line on the thing is, like, Daniel from the old neighborhood called, call him back. And we gave the text to Emily, and she wrote it out longhand and gave it back to us. And then I looked at it, and I realized that she had inserted a U into the word neighborhood. Because it's what you do. Uh, because of being Canadian. And so, to fix that bug, <laughs> instead of removing the U, I said, bug fixed, mom is now Canadian. So there's this little scrap of, of paper that's hidden under this bedside table, um, and you start to read it, and then Katie makes you stop reading it. Um, and it was this thing where it's, it, it's, it's an exception to the interactive expectations that you have. Like, it's one place, I guess the one place, where we really 
we really impinge on your ability as a player to do what you want. And Katie intervenes, basically, and it, it, was this, it was something that I thought was an interesting little one-off way of emphasizing the difference between the player and the character that they're playing as. And to you as a player, the note's just a note, but a reminder that, like, Sam is Katie's sister, and Katie wouldn't want to read this thing, and she's not going to keep doing it, even if you want her to. You know, there, there was kind of this um, intellectual, cross-cultural, um, like, pen pal thing that happened before the internet. You know, we used to write letters back and forth to each other about our ideas and about how we wanted to change things. And um, so a bunch of these women that I mentioned came up with this idea of Riot Girl, of, of being a punk rocker that was also an in-your-face feminist. Todd's band lost their singer. Todd said he sucked. Lonnie said he got sick of Todd's shit, and he was complaining about needing a new singer. So Lonnie was like, I can sing. And they were all kind of like, you can? And she was like, probably. But she's been rehearsing with them for like a week now. And I finally got to see them play in Todd's basement today. And she's actually really amazing. I feel so proud when she's on stage. It's incredible being in awe of someone you love. So everybody knows it's like a temporary situation till she ships out in June. But till then, I'm gonna be at every single show. There was a little bit of concern on my part before any of this got started that you never know how much liberty you're going to be given and how much over direction you're going to get because somebody hears it like a specific specific way and if you deviate from that at all it you're just going to keep doing the line over and over and over again like 50 times until it's right so i really wasn't sure what to expect but even on the first day getting in there and being able to go through a few of the lines and just give them what came to mind and seeing how closely I think everyone was on the page about it. So the direction was always really positive and it was always kind of um, coming from either additional information that changed the context of what I was reading or a certain change in the phrasing or the way something is being, you know, a pause here or maybe move it to here or instead of emphasizing this word, try this one instead. So you end up with a lot of different takes that really give it a very different feeling, depending on which one you go for. They tell you to stick with the group on field trips, Katie. There's a reason for that. Lonnie and I snuck off on the side paths at Multnomah Falls and got a little lost. Okay, a lot lost. Like, for hours. Right before the bus left, we found a trail and came running down the path, soaked and covered in mud, shouting for the bus not to leave. The school called home. Mom and Dad said, you didn't get into trouble like this before you met that Lonnie girl. But I don't think they know, no, about us. The kids at school, though, I'm really afraid that's a whole other story. Stick with the group, Katie. Stick with the group. Putback is the feature that I'm happiest with in the game. Uh, and it actually came about as sort of a little bit of an accident. Um, Playtesters told us they didn't want to feel like some kind of 
horrible person rummaging around this house and tossing everything on the floor. But there wasn't really any other option initially. Um, that's all you could do was sort of try and lob things back into the place. Um, so, you know, I had done uh, some code before for placing turrets and things in other games where it, uh, you know, will arbitrarily orient an object to be perpendicular to surface and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, I told Steve that, you know, we'd have a lot of edge cases with that and it would take some time to implement. And uh, temporarily I would just give him the ability to um, put uh, objects that these things would kind of uh, stick to um, in the game. And we tried that and it worked so well that we decided to keep that. And that's uh, where Putback came from. The music for Gone Home was mainly composed over two separate periods, roughly a year apart. A version of part one of the game had to be ready by October 2012 for submission to the 2013 Independent Games Festival, so I did all the part one audio logs primarily that September. The following summer I did another round of logs for the second half of the game, as well as some part one revisions in the ambient exploration tracks. One really nice side effect of the long gap between composition sessions, as well as the structure of writing music that is very literally accompanying a story was that I ended up hitting on pretty different ideas and approaches over time as I got further along in Sam's story. The original sketches I did had mainly electric piano sounds, which are warmer and more naturalistic than synthesizers and other electronics instruments. As Sam and Lonnie's story developed more though, I started to bring in acoustic guitar as well. It seemed like an appropriate way for the music to build up some more familiar natural elements, somewhat echoing Sam coming into her own. Eventually it became a really tonal element of the score. After that emerged, I started to more carefully control the instrumentation for the various main categories of log subject matter, uh, including Sam's self-reflections, Sam and Lonnie, Sam and her parents, and even Sam and Daniel. Some of those have their own melodies and themes as well. That wasn't really a grand plan from the start, and I, I don't expect everyone to really notice it, but it became one of my favorite things about working on this score. get Lonnie sometimes. Like, her band, and our zine, and her hair, and everything are all anti-authority. But I watch her in JROTC, and she's doing drills in perfect formation, following orders, no question. And there's all this stuff in the news about don't ask, don't tell. Like, she's going to join the army and then have to lie? About who she is? She said, they don't need to know what they don't need to know. Like it was no big deal. This from the girl who trashed her locker to, like, defend my honor. I've learned when to stop arguing, though. I don't think Lonnie even gets Lonnie sometimes. fanzines. I mean, that's one of the things that we started doing right away was doing these Riot Girl fanzines and everyone would contribute and write, um, you know, an article for it. Um, and then we'd compile it and make these Riot Girl fanzines and we would mail them out to people. I mean, I'll, you know, all this is so funny to talk about it before the internet, but, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, we used the mail and people would write, you know, we had a PO box and we started getting letters because people would um, read in someone else's fanzine, there's this Riot girl thing that started happening, right? And um, it just, I mean, I, 
it was the most incredible thing. It just snowballed. It just, people just, girls wanted to be a part of it immediately across the country, right? So from the time we started Heaven's to Betsy in 1991, I think it was only a year later, right? So one year of Riot Girl meetings and these letters happening and these fancies happening. Well, a year later, we left on the Riot Girl tour, the Heaven's to Betsy Ratmobile Riot Girl tour from Olympia to DC. Well, for some reason, it took us like almost five weeks to get there on this tour. And we ended up staying in DC another something like five weeks before the Riot Girl convention that happened. So that all of this, you know, all of these fanzines, all these girls across the country started getting interested in Riot Girl, and the press just went bananas. I mean, the press attention was off the hook. New York Times, USA Today, all these journalists wanted information and wanted to, to interview all of us. Um, and it was, it was just, it was, yeah, it was crazy. So by the time we got to the Riot Girl convention, suddenly we were truly part of a movement. Katie, you know how mom and dad are. Not exactly super open-minded about things. It feels like every minute I don't spend with Lonnie, I spend worrying about them finding out about us. And what would happen if they did? You know dad's joke about the nunnery that he'd tell whenever you brought boys around the old house? I wonder where he'd want to send me. So earlier in, in an earlier version of the story in Gone Home, um, Sam and Lonnie got caught together and Lonnie's dad was like an asshole about it and threatened to send Lonnie to live with her mom in Florida. Um, and we cut that, it was too melodramatic and it wasn't really interesting, it was an external force that was acting on them, which I wasn't super excited about in practice and so on and so forth, but um, it it caused there to be this concept of Lonnie's mom living in Florida, <laughs> which... Florida, you know, Florida is, of course, the worst place that you can live. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's not assume... But, um, that said, it's like, it's the other side of the country and it's totally, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. so foreign from, from Oregon and everything. Also, it's where I grew up. Yeah, that was, well, <laughs> so I was kidding. So, that's the, that's the, so, yes, the reason I think that, that Lonnie's mom lives in Florida is that I grew up in Florida and I moved from Florida to Oregon when I was like 19 and I've been back to visit, but, you know. <laughs> Uh, if if someone were to say to me, 
hey Steve, do you want to go back and live in Florida? I would take a sheet of notebook paper and I would write no on it as big as you can get and With hand it back stones. to you. <laughs> there would be knives, there would be yeah. gravestones, there would be Dead lightning, yeah. uh, big X's in the yeah. eyes, vampire teeth for some reason. I was largely unfamiliar with Florida and my family started going there every once in a while or when I was like in high school for Christmas because my mom hates being cold. <laughs> and um, Pick the wrong goddamn but, place to live, Mrs. Zamanja. Yeah, well, you know. Um, but anyway, the only thing that I remember basically is that uh, everybody had lawn flamingos, and uh, we went around Christmas, so I remember hearing on the radio multiple times dogs barking Christmas carols. <laughs> that's Florida. Florida sounds cooler than I remember it being. <laughs> In my head, that's Florida, right there. All of the sliding doors that you see in the game are actually, from a code perspective, drawers. Uh, when I made a thing that could slide along uh, a track like that um, for the purpose of making drawers, uh, Steve took it and, as designers are wont to do, uh, used it for his own purposes and uh, came up with sliding doors in our game. You know, it's really about the ideals that we were trying to um, get across in our music. You know, I think that um, the move to equality um, for women and for everyone in the U.S. is um, is something that we all want to be a part of, right? And we just we we used Riot Girl and we used music as the tool for that. You know. And that, but it's really to me, it's about um, it's about equality for everyone. That that I think is is the key, and that's why young people really um, feel passionate, and that they they listen to the music and they hear that um, that passion, and that's what they connect with. interesting talk with mom and dad tonight when you were never gonna need to have I mean you've known right I've known I've known since like she -Ra. mom and dad didn't I guess but they saw the zine and the stuff on the locker and they were like is there something we should know about you and Lonnie and so here's the thing I was prepared for them to be mad, or disappointed, or start crying, or something, but they were just in denial. You're too young to know what you want. You and Lonnie are just good friends. You just haven't met the right boy. It's a phase. That's what I didn't see coming. That they wouldn't even respect me enough to believe me. Well, joke's on them because they're in for one very long phase.
Uh, writing Sam was a unique challenge, um, just in the sense of, on the one hand, it was very much from my personal experience because it's about being a teenager and my memories from, from that time, you know, as, as an individual, but also who Sam was and, and what her experience was, um, came about as a result of kind of problem solving that we were doing, that Carla and I were doing, um, just figuring out what the story and what the conflict in the story was going to be. So, you know, by the time we figured out this was all going to take place in one house and the conflict was going to be between the members of this family and it had to be kind of irreconcilable differences that would cause serious um, drama between the members of this family, you know, we started thinking, what form could that take? You know, could it be that the, the, the teenager of the family falls in love with somebody that they're not supposed to and the parents don't agree? And what is the contemporary version of that? And so, you know, we, we at some point decided that we were going to write Sam as a gay character who had fallen in love with another girl and what conflict would that um, cause within the family, right? And we were excited about that opportunity just because of the paucity of that kind of, you know, narrative in games. And, um, you know, I remember when we came up with, uh, with that concept, just being like, oh man, this is going to be good. We actually get to do this, <laughs> which is really cool. But anyway, but uh, we actually, you know, yeah, we had to do a lot of work to um, make it plausible. Right. Well, because the other side of it is that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the writer on the game. And uh, on the one hand, a lot of teenage experience is universal. But I also, at some point, just had that very clear realization of, okay, I have just signed up for writing a gay teenage girl. Two, you know, two out of the three aspects of that character are not something that I've actually lived through. And so it, it you know, it, it was impressed upon me, especially, like, when I was working at Irrational, how important research was to getting your fiction right. Um whether it's, you know, very practical terms like how something works mechanically to what the characterization um, of, of the individuals in your story might be. And so, you know, my process was reading a lot of blogs about people's actual um, experiences growing up, being gay and being female, um, and reading fiction and nonfiction about people's experience, um, and doing original interviews with people that I knew in my life um, and asking them about what they remember about growing up with these experiences and being able to actually, you know, ask follow-up questions. Um, and I'm really grateful to all the people who have shared their experiences through writing and who were willing to share their experiences with me uh, personally, talking to me into a microphone so that I could refer to it later, which is just a huge leap for someone to take to talk about their own you know coming of age and, and all of those very personal uh, experiences but you know I couldn't have gone into writing this character with just saying well I'll just assume that I'll do an okay job and write it however mm -hmm. it seems like I should and instead saying you have to take this seriously and you have to actually reach out to people who have lived it so that when you're writing this character, it represents the experience of people like her in a way that is plausible and respectful and... Authentic. Yeah, that, that represents them in a way that, that you know, doesn't cheapen the experience that they've had by, by re relying on cliches or just kind of your expectations as, as an outsider. 